The title of my message today is, What's in a Name? Now, I have Pastor Sharon to thank because she reminded me of Shakespeare's uh, romantic tragedy, Romeo and Juliet. If you received our newsletter, she wrote in that, what is in, what's in a name? So let me quote from Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, Act 2, Scene 2, line 43 and 44. You have to do that when you do Shakespeare, right? It says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet. And if you are familiar with the uh, romantic play, Romeo and Juliet, you'll know that there were two families, the Montagu and the Capulets, and they had a family feud between the two of them feuding for, I don't know, generations and generations. And finally, when it came to Romeo and Juliet's generation, these two young people fell in love. And her whole thing was, gee, if his name hadn't been Montagu, then maybe this love that we have for each other would not be forbidden. Well, again, the message today is what's in a name? That name in the uh, Shakespeare play, it invoked a lot of anger and a lot of hate. How many times have you heard a name or uh, uh, saw a uh, uh, name or something and it stirred up uh, emotions inside of you. Maybe you someone you didn't like and you heard their name and you felt a little bit of um, resentment or if you're jealous or whatever the case may be. My point is this, that names absolutely do involve emotions. Why is it important? Well, I have to tell you, the Bible uh, puts an emphasis on names. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, the word name is referenced approximately about 1,017 times. That's a lot of reference to name. It's important. What's in a name? It's important because a name gives identity. We identify ourselves by our names. You know, it gives us this integral um integral uh, identity to the individual is what I'm going to say. It's a way of communicating. When we um, have uh, names, it's uh, the different, they serve as labels. We name Pastor Larry, Pastor Sharon, Elder Joy, Elder Bob. We name different ones with different labels and titles. It also is a social significance. And I'm bringing up all of this because if you think about it, your name is important to you. If I mispronounce uh, someone's name, they are very quick to correct me. Why? Because that name serves as their, their identity or the way we communicate with them. Or it has social significance. A lot of times, family names can carry social status and um, you know, ancestral pride, whatever the case may be. Names also have for legacy, you know, honoring a family tradition. You know, names are in symbolic. You know, the symbolisms that names hold. For instance, you know, you, we name our uh, different things in our lives are important. For instance, uh, you'll name your car, you know, something special to you, or you'll name your dog. Um, Rover, or um, I don't know, we named our dog Money. Uh, Pastor Larry said he decided that he would name our dog. We had a Doberman, and he named our dog Money. And his attitude was that, you know, if you have a, a cat, it won't come to you. But if you have a dog, a dog will always come to you. So that's why he named our dog money. So he would always say, here's money. <laughs> you see, the name had a meaning to us. And that, uh, I we miss our dog, as a matter of fact. Names also have legal and official purposes, and names have personal connection. For instance, 
I am Pastor Larry's wife. So I have a name. When you, when you call me Loretta Huggins, that gives me that connection to uh, Pastor Larry's family. Again, as I said, the Bible puts an importance on uh, names. Pastor, I didn't start my timer, but if you don't mind, that will be great. Praise God. I'll start it. And anyway, the fact is that uh, it gives us a personal connection. Now, before I go into why it is important or talk about the scripture, my main text, which is from Proverbs, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Let's talk about the significance of names throughout the Bible. For instance, you, we know that many people in the Bible, their names were changed. And many times it wasn't always for the better, but sometimes it was for the good. Now, before we go into uh, these different name changes, I like to point out a scripture from Genesis 2, 19 through 20. And it reads, I'll just kind of paraphrase it. You can check it, uh, study it later. But in Genesis 2, 19, it reads, Whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all God's creation. Now listen to this. Whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. Now that word call in Genesis 2.19 says whatever Adam appointed, whatever he proclaimed, whatever he summons, to every living creature. He didn't say this is a giraffe, this is an uh, elephant, this is a tiger. That's not how he named them, um, that, especially in the fact that even though in English we say giraffe, elephant, and so forth, but in Adam's day, they weren't speaking what we know as English. So what was he saying? How did he call these animals? What he was doing was giving them a position in God's creation. He was giving them their place, their status, their ability, what they can do. That's what a name is about. If you look at the word name, it talks about one's authority, one's character, one's characteristics, one's uh, uh, ability, status. That's what a name does when, as I said earlier, a name can be for social status. And, you know, and when you talk about Prince Harry or we talk about um, the president or we talk about someone else, these names give such a social status. Well, that's exactly what Adam did in Genesis 2.19. He named now, you got to take hold of this because Jesus is the last Adam, and we are as he is. And Jesus declares that this will be done, that he declares things in our lives. Well, we need to imitate God and start naming things in our lives the way we desire those things to be. Amen, church? Amen. Praise God. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We have to name them. That's what Adam did. He said, this is your status. This is what you're going to do. This is your status. You can be no more than this. You can do this. You can't do that. That's what God, God gave Adam the past of naming everything in his world, how would he now, with Christ in our lives, give us any less? We have the ability to name what's ever in our lives. If we see something we don't like, then we can name it powerless. We can name it destroyed. We can name it gone from our lives. We can Praise name, God. as Pastor named our 
money. We can say prosperity. I name you in my life. Well, let me move on. Praise God. I'm That's good. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, there are some positive name changes. There was Adam, I mean, Abraham. His name was changed from Abram to Abraham in Genesis 17, 1 through 5. For sake of time, I'm not going to read the scriptures, but in your study time, please look up those scriptures. Do as the Bereans. Be noble and study the scriptures to see if these things be so. And Abraham's God changed Abram's name to Abraham when he was 99 years old. So anything, stop naming yourself too old for things to be changed in your life. I can get a big Come amen. on, amen. This is good. Amen. amen. Glory, Glory be to God. God. Abraham was uh, I, Abram was 99 years old when God changed his name and then named him a, 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 a father of a multitude, a father of many. One uh, definition says uh, uh, of a crowded multitude. That's how it, it, it reads. Wow. So stop naming yourself, I'm too old. Stop naming yourself, Praise I God. missed my chance. I miss my opportunity. I don't know how many chances and how many opportunities Abraham missed or Abram when he was Abram because when God told him to leave his father and told him not to take Lot, not to take any of his uh, uh, relatives, he did not do as God said and took family with him. Missed an opportunity. How many times he may have missed an opportunity to see the hand of God. And yet at 99 years old, God still gave him victory and changed everything in his life. The Hallelujah. Name Praise God. Praise God. God. 99 years old. So you have a chance to have a better life. Amen, church. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. Hallelujah. You know, not all name changes. Well, let's not forget Sarah. Sarah was a, a barren. And, and she was, when it came time for her to have her child, the Bible says that she, her womb was good as dead. Sarah, uh, Abraham said he did not even take in uh, account that her womb was good as dead. Wait a second. She was barren all of her life. Stop naming yourself barren. Stop naming yourself. I can't do anything right. Stop naming yourself. Oh, it just seems like I can't get ahead. Stop naming yourself. Oh, I'm stupid. I can't believe I've done such a dumb thing. As a matter of fact, start naming when you do something dumb or stupid or whatever the case may be. Acknowledge it before God and then say, I name myself forgiven. I name myself blessed. I name myself successful. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Ooh, Glory that's good. Praise God. God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, as I said, Sarah's name was changed. From Sarai to Sarah. This is a woman who couldn't have any children all of her life. It didn't matter what age she was. All of her life, she was barren. But God gave her, it says in Hebrew, God gave her power and changed her, changed her name and gave her power. Power to bear a child. The Holy Ghost will come upon you, change you, change your name, change how you feel, change how you think about yourself, even change your physical body. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen, God. church. Hallelujah. Amen. 
Well, you know what? Not all name changes are good. I've been telling you not to call yourself this and not to call yourself that, but to call yourself blessed, call yourself redeemed. The Bible says in Psalms, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I name myself redeemed. And I say so. I say I'm blessed of God. I say I win on every single score. I say that maybe there are many on are my affliction, but the Lord delivers them, delivers me out of them all. I name myself delivered. I name delivered. myself victorious. I victorious. name myself the head and not the tail. Head Hallelujah. The tail. Glory to God. God. Praise well, the Lord. Lord. Amen. Said, Hallelujah. Amen. Let's let's praise God for that. Praise the Lord. Lord. Praise the Lord. It's another uh example of Name changes aren't so good. And even though you think that maybe I'm just trying to build you up, but it's scripture to not name yourself a bad name. We know the story of Naomi, Ruth and Naomi. Naomi, uh, when uh, there was a famine in the land and she and her husband uh, and her children, they, they left and went to a foreign land. Her sons, both her sons died. I believe her husband died. You may have to correct me on that. But I know her sons died. And then when she heard that it was time for her to come back to her homeland because the famine was over, um, she, her two daughters walked with her and her daughter-in-laws. And then one said, well, I'm going to go back. She said, go back to your home. And that daughter-in-law went back. And so here she left, uh, she left her homeland with a family of five or six. And now she's returning to her homeland with only a family of two. And you know what? She was broken. And when people called her Naomi, it says in Ruth 1.20, she said to them, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Her name Naomi meant pleasant. And she was so bitter and so broken down. She said, don't call me Naomi anymore. Call me bitter. That's what Mara means. So many times we have suffered uh, of disappointments. We have gone through things that, that, that have broken our hearts. Our dreams seem to be crushed and everything of the sort. And we have to be careful not to change our names to bitter not to change our names to resentful, not to change our names to hopeless, not to change our names to things that would keep us in a mold of failure. This is good, church. Here's the yes, scripture. it is. Amen. Here's the scripture. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but here she was so beaten down that she could not she could not stand to hear people call her pleasant. I know what that's like. I mean, Pastor and I, when we were newly married, there were things that were happening, and it just seemed like one trial after another that was coming against us. And one day, excuse me, I'm going to drink a little something. One day, Pastor Larry is ministering to me, and he says, Sweetheart, don't you believe we're blessed? And I have to tell you, I was so beat down, I could not say at that moment, yes, I believed I was blessed. Now, there may be some of you judging, oh, I'd never be like that. Well, that's you. But I know that out of 8 billion people on this planet, there's more than one person besides me that has had these moments where you felt so crushed. Even Paul said in the scripture, he said, Paul wrote two thirds of the Bible. And Paul said, I, I was in Corinthians. He said, I was so crushed down that I despaired of life. We Preach have to it. be careful yeah, what we on. say about ourselves when we're going through the worst of times. That's when it's most important for you to name yourself victorious. Preach it. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. And even if you mess up, maybe it was your fault. You messed up. 
Look at the story in 2 Samuel 12 and 24, verses 24 and 25. Um, here, um, uh, Solomon was born, and they named Solomon to uh, uh, David, King David and Bathsheba, named her, uh, named him Solomon, and that word means peace. His name means peace. But the prophet Nathan came to them and named him Jedediah. That's the second name of King Solomon. And that name is that beloved of God. Wait a second. This young man was born. He was born of the wife that uh, uh, that David, King David, had Uriah killed. Uh oh, am I over my time? I will make this really quick. David killed Uriah to take his wife. They had a child. That child died. And then they had a second child, King Solomon. And God sent a prophet to say, and he's beloved of me. You know what? I don't care how bad a situation is in your life. God forgives and you need to name yourself forgiven. Pastor, I'm going to just do a few more because I need to get to my main topic. But I want to share something about my own life. Oh, I have to share this. Not every name has power. You know, in uh, uh, Mark 5, 9, where Jesus asked of the uh, uh, possessed man, the devils that were in him, asked to say, what is thy name? People always say, well, Jesus wanted to know his name, or Jesus wanted to know if the devil would tell the truth. Come on, give me a break. Hello? Jesus knows that the devil, the Bible said that the devil is the father of lies. And one translation says, lying is the devil's native language. Wait a second. Jesus wasn't asking to see if the man had, uh, I mean, if the, the devil is going to tell the truth. What he was doing, that word asked means he confronted this devil and the word the uh, name means authority means character means integrity and jesus was confronting them challenging their authority and the only authority they could say is our name is legion because we're many it doesn't matter how many come against you there it can be that name but it's an empty powerless Name as a Joseph's son, the name of Jesus above all names. Well, I have to tell you, I'm this going is to good. Make this, uh, and it's uh, in this, but I want to tell you that about my life, and then I'm going to read the scripture. I was my parents, and Pastor Larry has a similar story to this. Pastor, uh, I was born and I was in this world for three days. And I did not have a name. Now, back in the day when I was born, uh, it was impossible for a parent to take their child home until they from the hospital until they had a registered name. My mother tells me this, that on the third day when they were about to send her home, the nurse came in roughly and said to her, you can't take your baby home unless you give her a name. <clears throat> My mother was just... just I'm her first child, she's just shaken, and she said, Loretta Young just res resonated through her. And then she blurted out to the nurse, Loretta. And the nurse said, Oh my God, that's a beautiful name. And then um, that's my name. Now, I grew up not necessarily liking my name. I don't know why, but I just didn't like it. But then I learned that my name means battle maid. My name means victor. My name means crown with laurel. You know what God named me and he named me and he said, Loretta, you will have difficult times in your life, but you are named a winner. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I don't care if people want to give me respect and they want to say my name. Oh, Loretta. 
They still calling me winner. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Oh, glory to God. My name, every time you call me Loretta, you're calling me winner. You're calling me victorious. You're calling me crowned with laurel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, the scripture is the name, put the scripture up for me. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run unto it and are safe. I told you what that name meant. It is a, 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 a position. It's an, a, 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 a position, a status. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. It is strength. It is security it for all areas of life, for your physical life, your material life, for your personal life, for your social life, for your political life. Look it up. That's what it says. The name of the Lord is a strong tower for whatever concerns your life. That word uh, tower is strong and it's, it's like a high place. But let me get you to this one word. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run unto it and are safe. Here's my end point. The name of the Lord is a safe place. And that word safe means to be placed so high, too high to be captured. Did you get that? Amen. Uh, wow. All Amen. About that. The name of the Lord will elevate you in your life so high the devil can't touch you. Did you get that? The name of the Lord is so powerful that it puts you so out of the reach of your enemies. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run unto it and they are safe. That is what's in a name. The power of God, the safety of God, the kindness of God, the love of God, the pro proclamation of God, the truth of God in your life. Pastor Larry? Well, praise God. Thank you. Amen. Everyone, let's just praise thank God Lord. together that Jesus thank has you. given us his name. Praise God. Thank you. Amen. Amen. He's given us the name that's the above name every praise name. You. Praise you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for yes. our praise new name. Hallelujah. Praise God. Our new name is Christian, Christ-like one, hallelujah, praise God, believer, son of God, child of God, heir of God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Pastor Loretta, thank you for that message. You've given me so much to think about. My wheels are really turning right now, and I'm sure everyone else's wheels are turning, but we always take a moment to talk to people who are watching and listening and I want to remind you of something that Pastor Loretta said is don't don't give yourself a name of defeat or sickness or weakness. Give yourself a name of victory and strength and healing, the healed of the Lord. Uh, so many people say, well, my arthritis, my bursitis, my this, my that, and they're claiming these uh, these circumstances as their own, these symptoms as their own. They're taking ownership of it, and that becomes their identity. Well, you know, I'm an old person. I'm a weak person. I'm a poor person. We need to take on the name of victory, the name of strength, the name of health, the name of pros prosperity. And I want to talk to you, if you're, not, if you're not a Christian, let me tell you what the word Christian means. <clears throat> it means Christ-like one. And Christos means the anointed one. And so when we say we're Christians, we're saying we are the anointed ones. We have the anointing of Jesus. Jesus came into our lives with his anointing because he is the anointed one and has empowered us to live victoriously. That's what he has for you and wants for you. He wants you to have a new life, a good life, a victorious life. And how do you do that? By claiming the name of Jesus is yours. Now, if you're adopted into a family, you have a right to take on that name and everything that name means. When my wife married me, she became no longer uh, Loretta Washington, 
or Simmons rather, Simmons Washington, but she became Loretta Huggins and she has taken on my name. She identifies with me and my legacy. When you take on the name of Jesus, you identify with him and his legacy. So what is what is getting saved? What is getting born again? Well, it begins by claiming that you're a Christian by faith and say, I'm, I'm in Christ. I'm a believer in Christ and I'm identifying with Christ and I'm I'm trusting in that name and everything that name means to keep me and to put me across in life and to give me a place in heaven forever. I want you to say a little prayer with me and I'm going to invite the Z team to unmute yourself and say it and just say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, Father I'm accepting the name of Christian. I'm, I'm accepting, accepting the name, the name, of, name Christian. of Christian. I claim that name for me. I claim I that name for me. From this day forward, I am a Christian. From this, From this day, day forward, forward, I am a Christian. I trust in Jesus. I trust, I trust in, Jesus. in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. I believe, I believe in, in Jesus. Jesus. Therefore, I can call myself Christian. Therefore, Therefore I, I can call myself, call myself Christian. Christian. And I have all the rights and abilities of that name. And I have all the rights and abilities of that name. In Jesus' name I pray. Jesus name, Jesus right? Name, right. Amen. So be it. Praise Amen. the Lord. Praise Hallelujah. the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I, oh, I tell you what, we're going to have fun in the afterglow today because we could just go off on that. I'm sure that everybody has uh, a lot to say or think about. And I want to invite you uh, to stick with us for the afterglow and also for communion and announcements and some other things. But we're going to do something that's very important. It's important for you and it's important for the kingdom. And that is to worship God or to honor God with their tithes and offerings. Now, let me tell you a little story. Amen. Praise God. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, years ago, when I was the co-founder and associate pastor of Faith Christian Fellowship, one of the members, I didn't really know him well, but I, it was a big church, but I'd seen him. He made an appointment to come and see me. Well, I thought it was some sort of a counseling appointment, so I certainly agreed to, to meet with him. And uh, we said hello and some pleasantries. And, uh, and I said, well, what are you here for today? What can I do for you? And he said, I came in here to find out how much money you make and where you spend it. And he said, every time I join a church, I make it my business to find out how much money the preacher makes and what he spends his money on. And I looked at him and I couldn't believe what came out of his mouth. And I, I'm just stripping gears. Uh, I'm having all these uh, thoughts and emotions. And uh, I was offended and I was angry and a little confused by his question why he would ask it. And, and I just looked at him and I'm thinking, how do I answer this? Kind of praying on the inside. And while I'm looking at him, I had a vision. I saw this guy as a big baby. His face was on this Gerber baby's body in a diaper. And I'm looking at this guy. He's a grown man, older than I was. And uh, I saw him uh, as a baby, a baby Christian in a diaper. And so instead of being angry with him, I you know, had more patience when I understood that he, even though he'd been in church a long time, he hadn't. He hadn't developed. He had arrested development. And I asked him, I said, so you make it your business to find out how much the preacher makes and what he does with his money, where he spends his money. He said, yep, that's right. He was serious. And I said, well, let me tell you, uh, first of all, um, I'm really offended by that. I said, you, you've offended me. That's an inappropriate question. And I said, but I, I don't have a right to tell you. I, I, I mean, uh, there's there's no, nothing that com compels me to tell you. I don't have um, a legal, um, you know, compulsion to tell you. I don't have a spiritual reason to tell you. Um, but I'm going to tell you how much you make because you asked me. And I said, before I do that, let me ask you a couple of questions. I said, uh, I know you're, I know you're a faith person, but have you ever been to the doctor? And he just looks at me like, 
He didn't know where that question was coming from. And I said, let me answer it for you. Of course, you've been to the doctor. We've all been to the doctor at least once. And uh, I said, let me ask you another question. Have you ever been to an attorney? Have you ever had any legal help? And I said, I'm going to answer that. You probably have. And I said, so here's my question. The average doctor, you know, with a good practice, do um, you think he makes more money or less money than I do as a preacher? Well, he just stares at me again. And I said, well, let me tell you, I, I think most doctors make a lot more money than I do, okay? And uh, I said, how about an attorney? Do you think an attorney, a good practicing attorney, with a good practice makes more money or less money than I do? And again, it gives me that blank, blank stare. And I said, well, I'm going to answer for you. I said, I'm pretty sure that most successful attorneys make more money than I do, probably a lot more money. And I said, um, but the reason your doctor gets paid is he's a trained professional who renders a valuable service for your life. And the reason the attorney gets paid well is because he's a trained professional and he renders a valuable service to your life. And I said, the reason I'm compensated, of course, is because the Bible says that they that labor by the gospel should live by the gospel. They that serve at the altar should, should live by the altar. God set up a plan for preachers. And I said, but uh, let me ask you what's more important in your life. Your physical well-being, it's important, but what's the most important? Your legal well-being, I said, that's important, but what's the most important? I said, it's your spiritual well-being. Your spiritual well-being is the most important part of your life. And if I were to be compensated according to the service that I render you for your spiritual well-being, I should be paid more than the doctor and more than the attorney because my service is more important because of your soul. Amen. And, uh, of course, you can't argue with that kind of logic. So uh, he just sat there. And I said, okay, I'm going to tell you how much I, uh, I made. I'm not obligated to. But I'm going to tell you because you asked. And I said, on one condition, it's just between you and me. People don't need to be bothered with what the preacher makes or where he spends his money. <laughs> I said, I, I, have a, I have a CPA that's concerned with it. I have a tax man who's concerned with it. I have board of directors who are concerned with it. But it, everybody else doesn't have to be uh, troubled by, uh, you know, trying to monitor where the preacher spends his money and that sort of thing. I said, they've got their mind on other things. So I told him. And he just, his, his uh, jaw kind of dropped. I said, you think I make too much money, don't you? And he said, well, yeah. <laughs> and the poor guy didn't hang around the church very long. You know what You know what gave it away for me when he said, every church I become a member of, I make it my business to find out what the preacher makes and where he spends his money. Every church you become a member of, what are you, a church hopper? <laughs> you know, you do this a lot. And every time you come into a church, you nose around to find out how much the preacher makes. Sounds to me like he had a problem. Well, uh, I thank God that you don't have a problem. You understand what the Bible says, that we're supposed to give double honor to those who labor in the word. So the workman is worthy Amen. of his hire, and you don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. I hope that helps someone today because, yes, a portion of what comes in to Z Church goes to the support of Pastor Loretta and Pastor Larry and our parsonage and all of that. And we thank you for your support. In fact, this is the plan that God has set up. And we, uh, we live by the Bible. And this is the way we do it because this is the way he wants it done. I'm going Amen. to pray for you. And I want you to honor God with your tithes and offerings. And I want you to rejoice because some of that blesses the preacher so that he can be a blessing to you. Thank you.